So I have a few remarks about building a healthier world. Um, and I'll share some high concepts with you. You won't see a whole lot of data on these charts. I could bring them out for you if you'd like on the healthcare reform tax structure, et cetera, if you'd be interested. But what I'd really like to do is focus on some high concepts and relate it to other industries about two things. The nature of what drives healthcare costs first. And then the second is the impending and very close, much closer than all of us think, retail nature of the healthcare marketplace which none of us are really quite prepared for, but will happen sooner than we think. So this system that we work in today is created in the 1950s, Hilburton, post-World War II, and hasn't changed much since then. We're now almost 18% of GDP. We waste $810 billion worth a year worth of healthcare with redundancy and administration, all the paperwork that goes around. And if you took this industry, which is growing at four times the rate of inflation, and you stood it on its own, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. We have exceptional treatment, but we really don't have a whole lot of impact on quality of life. And I think that's the big difference. We're focused on fixing things versus actually creating more productive individuals who, as a result, are more economically viable, who, as a result, are happy, and when we do that individual by individual by individual, we do that community by community, we have a better world than the world we're in today. So, um, whoops, that's not my slide. There we go. So I'm gonna focus on Tesla as an example of why we need to change the healthcare delivery system. So Tesla, how many people ever drove the first Tesla? kind of small, I barely fit in it. The new one, the Tesla S, cool car, everybody has one, my neighbors are buying one, everybody wants one. The only problem is they cost $85,000 if you can get one at that price. And in some places like New York, they're almost $100,000 to get a hold of a Tesla. We have charging stations now up and down the east and west coast of the United States, so you can go anywhere, and the charging's free. So the cost of operation is much lower than what we see in automobiles today, and the buying experience is a heck of a lot better. Um, we have a dealership in Manhattan. It's a very cool place to go. Uh, and so their only problem is, is they want a $35,000 car. Imagine if we had a $35,000 Tesla, free fuel available by 2018, the charging stations, the free charging stations will be available everywhere in the United States that you need to have them. And the buying experience would be great, but what's the problem? The problem is the lithium ion battery. It's the vast majority of the cost of the car, and the only way to get it down to a $35,000 price point, make it more affordable, so everybody can have one and pay for it, is that you have to re-engineer the lithium ion battery. And there was just recently an announcement of where that factory is going to be, a gigafactory, to re-engineer the, the lithium ion battery. So my, my, my posit to you is that the lithium ion battery of healthcare costs is the healthcare delivery system. And, a lot, and it's 80 to 85 percent of the premiums that we charge individuals for healthcare, by law now, in most places. And unless we re-engineer that, we can't fix it. So how do we create an ecosystem where we can make health care premiums affordable to everyone, where health care premiums are not larger than most people's mortgages, and the single largest line item on their expenses is a household? So this is one of my favorite slides. This is the way the system works for most people that have been in it. In 2001, my son was diagnosed with T-cell gamma delta lymphoma, incurred, uncurable at the time. And I quit my job, moved into his hospital room with him for a year and a half, and worked this maze. I ran a management process with my laptop computer and my Harrison's internal medicine text with my yellow sticky notes. I met with the medical team every morning about what our priorities were. And Eric today is the only one to ever survive that disease. And he is a quant at State Street Financial Advisors, a theoretical physicist by background, and he now lives a healthy life after receiving my left kidney in 2007 because his kidneys were damaged by his illness, the cure 
more than the illness itself. But this whole system is what I had to try and figure out. Nutritionists, psychologists, the changing of the attending versus the changing of the residents, the residents at night doing renal dosing when they were too tired. I used to get up at 2 a.m. to help them with the math just to make sure that it was right. The people in the cafeteria giving him food that he was allergic to, which had an impact on his kidneys and his recovery. Had a very good hospital with very well-intended people and very good clinicians. So this was the maze we had to navigate. And it hasn't changed much. And so what we need to do is think about how do we make it built around the consumer, the person who's actually going to be buying most of this health care in the future. It shouldn't be as hard as it is. You should be able to get care wherever you are. You shouldn't have to go to one specific place. It should be simple. It should be available and transparent. And most importantly, it should be affordable. So how do we think about doing that? Well, first, it's about re-engineering the structure of healthcare delivery by introducing different payment models, moving from revenue to margin. Doctors' practices work on cash flow. Hospitals work on revenue flow. Insurers work on margin. And when you try to put the economics of those three belief systems together, they don't work. And it's no wonder that we have the inflationary spiral we have in healthcare. So how do we get everybody to a margin? Now, why is margin important? Because if you don't have a margin, you don't have a mission. That's by one of the largest not-for-profit health systems in the United States. No margin, no mission. So we need to have a margin, and how do you do that? Well, you make sure that you're applying your resources against your issues most effectively and generating an outcome that avoids rework, redundancy, waste in the system. The second part is a consumer experience about how they buy it. And so it should be a lot simpler for them to buy it. I buy my health care every year when I sign up for enrollment, and it is a quagmire for me, and I run the company. Which network should model should I be in? Should it be an EPO, a PPO, an HMO? What should it be? What kind of benefits should I have? Geez, what did I use last year? Geez, what, break my leg this year? I mean, what do I, what kind of things are, what kind of drugs am I on? Where can I get them? Is it on formulary? Is it not? Way too hard. And so the models we're working on in our company is it's a $10 copay and there's one deductible, everything else is covered. Because it can't be this hard. And there are three ways to deal with this. One, we have to make it really simple for the people who use healthcare on an episodic basis. 75 to 80% of Americans use healthcare on a fairly commodity basis. Flu shots, lab tests, x-rays. And so they should be able to get them where they want them, when they want them, at their own cost and on their own time. It should fit into their life versus their life having to fit into it. And then we've got other folks who are really, really sick. And those folks, we, need to, we have to have concierge medicine around. We have to surround them with care management, with all the sorts of things that help them navigate a healthcare system, that maze I pointed to before. Had I not made it my job to manage my son's care, he would be dead today. And then the third group is really the group, the investment in wellness. Yes, it takes 20 to 25 years. But if we don't do it now, we'll never get there. And so the way we should think about the, this journey to wellness is let's create more room in the system by eliminating the waste, focusing on those people who are really sick. And then let's make the investment in wellness for the 20 to 25 year journey we need to make in order so that people don't get sick on the other end, so that we have fewer of them that we have to put into concierge medicine later in life. And then we need to create an experience where people can buy this directly on their own time and actually enjoy it. Now, if you look back at auto insurance 15, 20 years ago, very hard to buy, very much a commodity, you had to go through a broker. Today, people buy it online all the time, and it's pretty straightforward. What changed? They started thinking about the person buying the product and using it. And we believe that leads to people who are more productive, 
And as a result, they are more economically viable, and we believe that they are happier as a result. And we believe it begins to redefine work. So work should not be about having a job. Work should be able to you, allow you to do the things in your community that you like to do and get properly paid a fair wage for it. At Aetna, we have 20,000 employees who work from home full time. They never see an office. We send them their work. They do all their work at home. Their relationship is with their community and being involved with their kids and with their schools, not with having to commute to work every day. So if we begin to redefine work as not a job, but being able to service your community, particularly in healthcare, how many nurses do we have in local communities that could be helping people in their own neighborhoods? If we could create the logistics, we can also then support better health and happiness and better communities. So how does that work from the provider side, from the economics of the provider side? Well, first it's about revenue neutrality. How do I live in two worlds of fee-for-service versus payment for value? I'll use a dirty word from the 90s, capitation, or global payments, I guess is the term a lot of people use now, and still remain revenue neutral. We have to find models to do that, and we're very much focused on that at Aetna and some of the ACO deals we're doing to create revenue neutrality as health systems of institutions and doctors move from one revenue model to the next. The second is really about clinical efficiency. How do we make the system work better? What kind of data can we use to help the system work better? To take care of people, to get in front of care issues, like a lot of work we're doing around congestive heart failure and diabetes. And then the third is supply chain efficiency. Do we have to have five separate hips in the inventory for the OR based on the number of groups we have? How many stents do we need? What if UPS could deliver a sterile kit to an OR an hour before the procedure with the appropriate implant and all the equipment that the physician needs and the staff needs for that procedure instead of the hospital having to support it? Supply chain efficiency. And then finally, as we understand how the system works under this new model, how do we think about the capital efficiency of the system? How do we begin to shift the thinking about capacity and where facilities and providers of care need to be? And if we have the data and we watch the system change through revenue neutrality, clinical efficiency, and supply chain efficiency, capital efficiency now begins to take care of debt service, access to the capital markets, and provide for a more affordable experience. And so at Aetna, this is our ACO strategy, rebuilding the lithium ion battery for healthcare about creating a longer term relationship that goes all the way to access to the capital markets and thinking about capital efficiency. So here's about the revenue to margin model. So if we do margin on our episodic care is higher, but if you start moving it into managed care, you start to see a revenue drop. You start to see the cost of investing in an ACO but then we start to see patient volume as we begin to capture leakage, then clinical and supply chain efficiency, insurance profits because you're taking risk, and capital efficiency improvements. Our aim is to take our company away from an insurance company to a logistics company and somebody who helps health systems access the capital markets. You need to be in our business, not us, because you're taking care of the patients. And when you're at risk and you understand this margin model, we're going to have better outcomes and you're going to be more financially solvent in a world where healthcare needs to be more affordable. It needs to be a $35,000 car, not a $100,000 car. So let's talk a little bit about retail. This is the Iron Triangle. I changed it a little. Right, because you all talk about the Iron Triangle as access, to access, quality, and cost. But if you introduce the actors in the system, consumers, employers, and providers, they each have different expectations around these accesses. So between consumers and employers, it's about cost and access, but between consumers and providers, it's about access and quality. And this is an impossible formula to solve. X squared plus Y squared equals E squared. 
really hard formula to solve. And when you have multiple actors in the system and not one person acting on the system, it's even more impossible to change the behavior to solve this problem. So two events are gonna happen here very soon. In 2016 and beyond, we're gonna to start to see corporate tax reform. And I sit on a few corporate tax reform groups and it's a bit like liar's poker among CEOs. I wanna talk about tax expenditures to get the lower tax rate, but I wanna talk about your tax expenditures, not mine. Well, there's one tax expenditure that all employers share that if we can agree to it, we can lower our tax rate as a trade-off. That's the employer deductibility of health insurance. It's on the table. It's got momentum. If that doesn't happen quick enough, by 2018, the Cadillac tax goes into effect, and by current numbers, and if you inflate them a little bit, more than 20% of employers will be paying a 40% excise tax on the amount of money over the Cadillac tax amount. You're starting to see it impact union negotiations now. And if that's indeed the case, then the employer deductibility of health insurance is going to go away. And when it goes away, employers are gonna give the money to the employees and let them buy it. And the distribution model will need to be marketplaces where individuals can buy their own health insurance. So what happens is that it's really about access and quality. That's what begins to drive the system. The employer is no longer involved, it's between the consumer and the provider. And if we're out of the way, because you're all in the business of managing risk, this becomes the fundamental formula that changes everything. This is population health management. But it's in a retail marketplace. And none of us, including my company, are prepared to deal with this. So I have a couple of interesting examples for you. Here's what consumers want in our studies of consumers, because we're getting ready for this. We're making investments in this because we believe that they're gonna be the people buying care and they want a multimedia experience that helps them manage their healthcare costs, keeps them healthy and helps them navigate the healthcare system. None of that's readily available today in the disjointed maze I showed you before. But they've got other parts of the world where they can do that. How many people have seen one of these? This is the Coca-Cola microdosing system. <laughs> you can now buy smaller portions and you can even mix all the Coca-Cola products into a formula that you like best. And guess what, the revenue per ounce is higher than you buying it by the can or the six pack. And people love this machine. They can't make them fast enough and Coke has got the potential of losing customers. If they have stores saying, I'm gonna keep your product as long as you get me one of these machines. Now can you imagine how much resistance they found from the bottlers in putting together this program? People love this thing. If you haven't tried it, you should try it. People love it. So this is all about me. This is the way I wanna drink soda. And by the way, the soda companies are seeing decreasing share, right? Because I grew up on soda in my lunch pail when I was a kid. My kids never saw a soda in their lunch pail. But this is a huge advance. Then I have another one for you. How many have seen one of these? There's one right around the corner from me in Manhattan. It's in the Duane Reeds in the corner. It is the Amazon Package Pickup Center. And so when you buy something from Amazon, you can say, instead of delivering it to my house, drop it off at the local Duane Reeds, or hey, you know what, I'm gonna be in Rochester, Minnesota, drop it at whatever Rochester, Minnesota location it is because I'm gonna be there for a couple of days, and you get a code number as soon as it's dropped off, you go over, you punch in the code number, and out comes your pallet with all your stuff. About me. It's a personalized experience. It's where I want it, when I want it. So this is happening in all of our consumers' world, and they're about to walk into your facilities, and they're about to buy our products, our collective products in some way, shape, or form. And they're not gonna see one of these, and they sure aren't gonna see one of these. And they're gonna say, why is this good? Why does this work for me? And if you've noticed the low utilization over the last couple of years, it's because people are now spending 41% of the healthcare dollars spent by an individual pulling money out of their own pocket for their premiums or for their cost sharing. 
and they're saying, I don't want to buy what you have. Unless I'm on death's door, I'm not going. Because the experience is nothing like this or like that. It's more like that maze I showed you before. And there's a great video on YouTube. Go out and watch it. It's about what if air travel were just like the healthcare system. Now we're all connected to the healthcare system, and when you watch this thing, you start laughing your head off, and then you get totally and mortally embarrassed about halfway through. What do you mean I have to contact a luggage person to go get, come up to my house and pick up my luggage? Why can't I just give it to you to take it? Oh, we don't do that. That's a separate part of the system. Just imagine. So go look at that video. It's how people think about our healthcare system. So it's really about a new healthcare ecosystem. You'll notice there are no insurers in here. It's about consumers working with providers and through retail marketplaces and systems that are taking risk. And you should be selling to your local populations and taking care of the people in your community because you know them. And you should get paid for the risk you're assuming based on the demographics, disease burden, economic, social, and environmental trends of your community. And we'll help you do that and we'll be your bank. But we shouldn't be in the middle of this anymore. It doesn't work. You need to be engaged in a way that has an outcome for the individual that makes them come back to you time and time again, keeps them in your system, makes them healthier, and makes you part of this ecosystem, and makes, generates a margin for you that allows you to keep your mission going. So that is my pitch. I hope you have the courage to make the change. I am making the change, and I can tell you I have overt resistance inside and outside my organization because they believe I'm crazy. But I think this is our challenge because there's never been a time the Affordable Care Act has been an action forcing event that allows us to make these changes and it is a burning platform that we should all take advantage of to make significant advances on how we deliver care, recreating the lithium ion battery. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Do you have a Tesla? No, nope, not yet. Not yet. I don't, I, I, buy, I buy ride motorcycles, whoops. Right, okay, with a helmet? <laughs> of course. Okay, thank you. Um, how's your son? My son's great. That's great. Um, because of uh, time, we're gonna excuse you. Great. And uh, move to the next uh, part of the segment, but there's uh, so much to think about, thanks so much. Yep, thank you. Great, take care. Take care, everybody.